Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to our HSBC Premier World Webinar. My name is Selim Kwan, and it's a great pleasure to be the moderator today. Now, as we step foot into the second quarter of 2022 and look back at the past quarter, it has been a rather eventful and challenging time for the markets, which braced through uncertainty and volatility. Several headwinds set a tone as equities declined and bond yields rose aggressively. Higher inflation versus slower growth. Central bank's monetary policy tightening, followed by Russia-Ukraine's geopolitical crisis and China's renewed outbreak of its zero-COVID policy, cast a shadow over the long-term outlook as rising commodity, energy and food prices and supply chain disruption further added the inflationary pressure, which left the markets struggling for directions. Will inflation, fear and rising rates continue to remain an overhang for markets? And what could be the implications and opportunities moving forward? Well, today we are delighted to have our guest speaker, Mr. AJ Dyer, who is here with us to discuss on building protection against rising inflation and bond yields. AJ will share insights on global market outlook and how investors can position a more resilient portfolio to safeguard against the market uncertainty and volatility. AJ is Director and Client Portfolio Manager for Peerage, which is fully owned investment business of Franklin Templeton. AJ worked with Leigh Nissen for over a decade as a Managing Director and head of the equity product specialist group before joining Franklin Tiberton in the takeover in 2020 and moving over to Peerage on a dedicated basis. AJ has represented Peerage investment capabilities for over 13 years. Now we welcome questions from participants and I believe there could be quite a number of questions you would like to post to AJ. So please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. All right, without further ado, let us invite AJ to begin his presentation. Hi AJ. Uh, good afternoon to everyone out there in, in Malaysia and the Southeast Asia. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the call. All right. So I will pass the call over to you. Over to you, AJ. Thank you. Fantastic. Let me share a screen and uh, I can then engage with you on this presentation. So what I want to share with you today, and thank you for all being on this call. I can see there's a, you know, maybe a couple of hundred people on this call today. There's obviously a great interest on in how to protect against this rising inflation and the onset of rising interest rates. Now, obviously, if you're a, a saver in a bank account, rising interest rates are a good thing. But for many people, in terms of people who are borrowers, people who run businesses, often rising interest rates are rising costs for those businesses, which often means less profits. So it's, it's going to be an interesting balance between rising interest rates in the world that we have today and how businesses can compete how they can continue to generate strong profits, and which are the areas in the world that you can find that in, which are more resilient to the issues of inflation and to the issues of rising interest rates and bond yields. So today's presentation is very much about why I believe that infrastructure is a solution to that problem. Infrastructure companies often have direct or indirect linkages to rising inflation and rising interest rates. So as these things happen in the marketplace, often infrastructure companies can compensate, i.e. effectively they can raise their prices or raise their revenues by other means. They can compensate for the impact of inflation. They can compensate for the impact of rising interest rates. So infrastructure companies, the right ones, selected well, put into a portfolio of companies can actually enhance your overall client portfolio and your client experience because you can actually have something which is stable, steady, ticking away over time and delivering a nice level of return. The other thing that infrastructure can do 
is deliver a nice, healthy level of income. Infrastructure companies, think about them. They're like utility companies and user pay companies. These are companies that can provide steady levels of dividends, steady levels of growth over time. They're not companies for today or for tomorrow. They're companies for the next decade, two decades, three decades. So these are long-term companies with long-term assets, generating long-term cash flows, generating long-term dividends. These companies structured well, put into a portfolio, can act as an attractive long-term return profile for investors with the right long-term mentality. So that's why I want to speak to you today a little bit about what's happening in the world today, global macro environment, and then take it to the infrastructure world and see how these companies can respond to that changing environment and why I think it makes for an interesting strategy for your portfolios. So what do we see today in the world, right? What do we see happening? What are the kind of the probabilities and the possibilities that effectively the world is talking about? And Celine, in her introduction right at the beginning, talked about some of the concerns that the world has today. Now, we look at this as the wall of worry, the wall of worry, right? And often stock markets are very good at continuing to rise even though that there's, there are many, many concerns in the world. So if we look at this wall, what do we see as key issues today? Things like if we stop at the bottom, populism, you know, effectively governments changing, uh, you know, people wanting change. We see that in France today. You see a strong election battle between Marine Le Pen uh, and uh, Emmanuel Macron. Around the world, you're seeing strengthening populism, where the population has become very divided, and they're looking for a new change. We look at the problems within EM in terms of, you know, what's developing. Um, are we seeing continued levels of rising inflation in the impact of that on certain markets within the emerging market sphere? We also look at the impact of lockdowns. Let's take, for example, China, where the impact of lockdowns are now starting to impede economic growth and the certain satisfaction of the population of certain cities. Now, living in Malaysia, many of you as you are, you know, we've obviously lived through a significant amount of lockdown and restrictions, as we have in the UK, where I'm based. So the world has gone through these significant changes. Our behavior has also changed. The question is, is the world going to return to normal normalcy? Or is there going to be changes in the world in terms of supply chains, how business operates? So when you think about that, think about that, the fact that during the pandemic, things that were sent from one part of the world to another became far more restricted. And because of that, companies couldn't build, let's say, in Europe or in Asia because they were waiting for component pieces from other parts of the world. Now, what's happened is many businesses have recognized they do not want to be put in that position again. And so what they're starting to do is starting to build resources and onboard certain types of better facilities, more domestic supplies for their goods. So buying the component pieces from other companies in local regions, local countries that they can depend upon. This means that supply chain links, as we call it, are going to develop over time. Look at let's look at some of the other concerns that we have on this wall. The inflation concerns, the corporate leverage concerns that effectively many companies have been borrowing very, very cheaply for long periods of time. And now that interest rates are potentially rising, this may mean additional costs for these companies. We have the, the question of potentially China over tightening. You know, what we actually see that is changing very dramatically now. The Chinese government has started to increase leverage, increase its credit facilities, its banks are lending more, and this is leading to a kind of strengthening the economy, and it has to, to compensate for the lockdowns. And then if we look at the middle section, you know, COVID-19, well, we're all been living this for the last two years. It's been over two years since our economies, our populations, our people have suffered through this period. But these leave many scars, not just the human scars. They leave scars on businesses. Businesses are less willing, potentially, to invest for the future until they have more certainty. And I'm sure many of you are business owners on this call today. You know, it's less easy to look into the future and forecast how business can grow. And so you're looking at kind of getting a balance between stability for your business, 
so that you can continue the strength of your business long term, but also looking to build out in the future. And in the same way, when we build portfolios, we think about the same thing. How do you build it for stability today, but also for growth tomorrow? What are we else are we looking at? Midterm elections, very U.S. Uh, orientated, but obviously we have the midterm elections in the US where they effectively vote for new senators and congressmen and women. And this can lead to a political shift in the landscape there. Right now, it looks like the Republicans are going to take a few more votes, but this could change the tone of the US. Interestingly, you know, I think what you're already seeing is strong changes in the US. And I'll give you a very simple example. Four or five months ago, President Joe Biden was very much about increasing green energy and reducing substantially carbon-based energy, oil, gas, and coal. Today, because of the concerns of Ukraine and Russia, which is a real tragic situation that is unfolding uh, in that part of the world, it's actually led to a rise in oil and gas prices around the world dramatically. And what's happening is, you know, Europe as many other countries do, but Europe needs more energy from other sources. Countries like Germany rely on 40% of their energy comes from Russia, especially in terms of oil and gas. The dependency ratio is very high. So what we're now seeing is countries like Germany say, we need to get our gas supplies from other parts of the world. And the European Union is acting in unison to collaborate and cooperate with other countries around the world, like the US, like Qatar, to get energy supplies to them. That's leading to people like President Joe Biden telling his oil and gas companies to drill more. So within the space of three months, you have a president going from, I want to have a green economy, and he does, he still wants to continue that, but to him turning that around 180 degrees and telling his oil companies and gas companies, please drill more, we need to send more energy to Europe. So politics can change the dynamics of economic policy uh, around the world. And right at the top of this, we look at equity valuations. Have they been too high? We know that the stock markets this year have fallen. Across the world, global equity markets are down between 2 and 5%. Many of the growth portfolios, uh, technology companies, biotechnology companies, pharmaceutical companies, uh, Uh, luxury good companies, these types of portfolios are down 15 to 20% this year. These are dramatic reductions in the market. But generally speaking, the market is down about 5%. So is there a question that these valuations have come down because of growth concerns, because of the concerns around Russia, Ukraine, or is there an opportunity for some of these companies to bounce back as we move away from the pandemic and we still start to find stability? That's a balancing issue. You know, it's one which I'll tackle in a few slides. And then, you know, the the top two are people like the Fed policy. And the reason we call it a Fed policy error, and again, I apologize for some of the technical terms here, but it's it's the central banks around the world becoming too strong in their decision making and tightening effectively and raising interest rates faster than they should. Remember, as they increase interest rates, They are combating inflation. They are effectively, hopefully, dampening inflation. But the other side of that is they are probably dampening consumer spending, also dampening business expenditure and capital expenditure for the future. So the Federal Reserve and the central banks all over the world have to be careful of getting that balancing act right between raising interest rates and dampening inflation and killing off their economic growth, which is developing around the world after COVID. And obviously, if they don't get it right, this can lead to issues like civil unrest around the world because food prices are rising, fuel prices are rising. You see unrest in all parts of the world, in Africa, in Europe, in Sri Lanka. We saw some significant civil unrest around the world as people have to pay for higher fuel prices, higher food prices, higher agricultural prices, higher fertilizer prices. All of these impacts will be felt. And so we have to be very careful about the impact that has on the world. So how has the market responded, right? And here's the interesting thing, right? You know, we have all this negativity in the market, and yet markets pretty much have continued to rise. Yes, they've come down a little bit broadly, 
the global equity markets are down between two and four percent this year globally. That's all. You know, it may seem more depending on if you have a more high growth, spicy portfolio. But generally, global markets are down between two and four percent depending on currency. But if you look at this chart, this chart goes back nearly kind of 25 years. And what it's showing is each of these gray periods is when we have kind of periods of recession, economic slowdown happening in the world, 2001 to 2002, 2008 to 2009 during the global financial crisis. And really during the pandemic in 2020, we had economic growth in many countries in the world come down quite sharply. But throughout that whole period of time, you know, people's wealth came down initially, and then it's risen. And this is just a chart for the US. It's obviously different in other parts of the world. But it kind of shows you that, you know, p- countries have been spending more, countries have been growing. And the US is one of the biggest consumers in the world. So if the US consumer is feeling wealthier, that contributes to economic health around the rest of the world, because they are the big buyers of goods and services from all over the world. You know, we see this. So we see that the American public has effectively increased their wealth by $28 trillion since the pandemic. So they're not poorer post the pandemic. I think most people, there are a lot of people around the world which would feel like they feel a bit poorer after the pandemic. Their wages may have only increased a little bit, their costs, the inflation have risen more. You know, they may have even sadly lost their jobs. But in the US overall, the US household is worth $28 trillion more. And this is driving more spending, more purchasing, more purchasing of cars, consumables, electronics, uh, new housing. So all of these things are spurring economic growth. And we see this developing in other parts of the world. Now, you might say, well, that's very US centric, but let me, how does, how do markets respond when interest rates rise, right? So I'm going to use the example of the US stock market just to give you an idea, Um, because there's a lot of data around the US stock market and it's the US which is increasing its interest rates, you know, on a very clear path. It wants to increase interest rates by over 2% in the next 12 months. If you look at this chart, and I apologize, there's quite a few numbers on here. It's taught, it mentions four different periods when we had interest rate rises, key periods, 1994, 1999, 2004, and 2015. And what we're trying to show on this chart is to say, how did the stock market perform before the interest rate rises? You know, in in the three months and the six months before the rate rise, where, you know, the central bank was telegraphing to the, maybe to the economy, to the public, we are going to be increasing interest rates at some point. And how did it perform just after, six months after, 12 months after? And what we can see very clearly here is coming in before interest rate rise, either six, three months or six months, generally speaking, stock markets were positive. Then in the first three months after an interest rate rise, stock markets were negative. The S&P, which is a benchmark for the US stock market, it came down. But you can see the numbers are not that dramatic. They're only down between 2 and 6% in that first three months after a, uh, the interest rate rise. And then if you look forward six months, 12 months after the rate rise, you can see that the markets actually picked up again. So historically, Even though initially markets come down, this is the same in many, many other markets around the world. Initially, as interest rates rise, the stock market is trying to adjust. It's trying to figure out the right value of these companies. And so many of these companies sometimes get marked down, reduced in price, as they're trying to think through the impact of rising costs, rising interest rates, rising debt finance. And then as they look at which companies can benefit from that, or at least adjust their prices, Investors then come back to those markets, to those stocks, and you often see a a rise in some of these kind of businesses. And that's what the market has demonstrated in the last few years. So where do we see economic growth coming through? And look, again, I'm going to talk about the US partly because it's, you know, it's one of the world's two largest economies. We know that China, Chinese economic growth was just under 5% for the last 12 months. They came up with a relatively strong number, stronger than people expected. But the question is, with the economic lockdowns that they're having in Shanghai and other parts of China, how is that going to affect economic growth? So we need to have different engines in the world 
firing. And if we look at the big economic engine in the world, the US, how is that doing? Well, actually, you know, if you look at the recession risks, they're well below average. We don't look at many risks in the US as being critical to creating a US recession. The economy should actually strengthen more as people come through this latest wave of COVID, which is Omicron. And so why are they doing that? So, you know, people are going back, people are traveling, people are shopping more, people are actually buying more goods again. So we should expect economic growth to be strong, even with rising inflation. And so when we look at the balance between rising inflation, which is a headwind, right? You know, people don't want to pay rising costs, but at the same time, can they afford to do so? Uh, and, you know, are they being paid more in terms of wage growth? And the answer is yes in the US. So we think on balance right now, the consumer, the positive aspect of the consumer is stronger than the headwinds against the consumer. And businesses are investing. Here's the most important point. Businesses are looking at the future and saying, this is an economic growth profile we can have. We can grow here and develop. So I think this is a very, very interesting perspective for us to grow. So, you know, US markets have continued to grow, continue to develop. And then if we look at the market side, it, they are continuing to do extremely well. US markets have come down only a few percent this year, right? There has been some choppiness, as we call it, you know, but the, the market has started to really accept that we're going to start to see rising interest rates. And they're starting to recognize that's going to be a plan for the next 12 to 18 months. This year, we should potentially see six interest rate rises by the Federal Reserve. So we're talking about a very strong policy of change here. And as I mentioned, you know, right now, the way we look at it is the markets will come off a little bit. When interest rates happen, uh, rises happen, there is often a sell off in certain companies, but often we look at that as a good opportunity for some, some companies, select companies, to try to buy those really good long term growth companies at a better price. So, again, selectivity is key. So, one year out, what do we think will drive the market for the next 12 months? If we look forward, what are the things that will drive it? We think that inflation is, is rising, absolutely. Today in the US, it's about nearly 8%. In the UK, it's 7%. In Europe, it's 6%. In many parts of Asia, it's between 5 and 8%. We're seeing high levels of inflation that we haven't seen for 20, 30, 40 years. We're seeing the highest level of inflation in the US for over 40 years. Highest level of inflation in the UK, where I live, for over 30 years. These are not small impacts. But the other side of that is that we're probably going to see as interest rates rise, the dollar getting stronger. And when the dollar gets stronger, it's often very attractive for emerging markets and other countries in the world in terms of their international stock markets, because investors go and buy those companies as they benefit from growing effectively demand. The American consumer feels stronger, wealthier. They buy more goods internationally. Secondly, valuations. We do not think valuations, broadly speaking, are that expensive. The US stock market, you know, is has been quite expensive, has come down a little bit now in price. But around the world, Europe, Asia, emerging markets still look extremely reasonable on forward valuations. We actually think there's really good stock selection opportunities in many of these markets. Where do we see market leadership coming from? So if we look at it in terms of countries, we probably think that there's some good opportunities outside of the US in the next couple of years, because many of these countries, especially in Europe, have not been looked at. If you look at, for example, the UK, where I'm based, the dividends of many of our companies are actually very attractive. And yet the stock market is still trading at valuations of five years ago in terms of you know, the actual PE, long-term PE valuations. So companies have gone up in price, so of their profits. So if you look at the multiples these companies are trading at, they're not as expensive as people think. We know that as well in emerging markets. Emerging markets have come down between 15 and 20% this year. Again, different markets are at different speeds. And I think as the dollar strengthens, the US consumer continues to spend, it could actually be a very good catalyst for some of those emerging market companies, those consumer companies, those product businesses in Asia and emerging markets. If we look at the international side, you know, uh, the international peg, where internationally, where do we see the opportunity being the greatest? And, you know, again, 
It's selectivity. Right now, there are so many unknowns in terms of how the, the world is going to develop from COVID, which countries are going to stop, start. You know, we see countries opening up and then shutting down again as they have COVID problems. But we now have multiple vaccinations around the world. The number of vaccinations is increasing dramatically. More and more of the emerging markets and third world countries are being vaccinated to a higher level. And that's a good thing, because if we want to be able to travel, if we want to conduct trade around the world, then we need the world's population, not just the wealthy population, but the total world's population to be healthier. And so we see this as an opportunity that internationally over the next 12 to 18 months, as more vaccines are delivered to the countries that haven't really received their supplies, because let's be honest, they are lower socioeconomic countries. They haven't been able to grab hold of the vaccines. As they start to receive vaccines and vaccinate their populations, we should see, again, economic activity returning to many of those kind of places. And then volatility. I think volatility is absolutely you know, substantial in the markets right now. With all the things that were happening in terms of Russia-Ukraine crisis, which is very tragic, the issues around COVID and the pandemic, the issues around inflation, market investors will continue to have a lot of volatility. And so... We recognize that's going to be the case, but that also gives opportunity. Volatility can give you opportunity. When the market sometimes gets overexcited about a stock and raises the price of that stock, that's often the opportunity for you to say, I'm going to sell that company to somebody else who wants to pay more and pick companies where the market is becoming more fearful about. So, you know, in the adage of, you know, Sir John Templeton, you know, who was a great investor, he often talked about when effectively when investors uh, get greedy or the market gets greedy, you should be fearful. And when the market is fearful, you should get greedy as an investor. You should look at trying to buy differently to the market longer term. So, right, this, this point here is uh, over five years, what can save the world? What can drive the world to broader economic expansion and health and capital investment? That's the key answer. We need to invest more. There's a huge amount of global savings that are earning very little money. So where can that money be invested for long periods of time that can earn healthy levels of return? And companies need that investment to grow as well. So capital investment by us as investors, investing in at the right types of companies, the right types of mutual funds or unit trusts can then support these businesses to grow over time. So let me take, talk to you about some of the biggest themes that are happening around the world today, which are going to drive the change in the world, not just for the next two or three years, but for the next two to three decades. These are things that your children are going to be facing and benefiting from in the future. And the key one is infrastructure, right? Infrastructure is going to be the biggest kind of revolution that the world is going to have over the next two to three decades. And the reason for that is we all want a cleaner world, right? We all want the green revolution. Why? Because we want to live in a world where temperature hasn't risen so much that it affects our lives dramatically through climate change. I think most people now accept climate change in one form or another. So if we want the world's temperature to stay below one and a half degree increase, that's going to take a hell of a lot of spending to do the investments to make cleaner energy, cleaner facilities, cleaner transport, cleaner housing. And I mean cleaner from an energy perspective, right, from an emissions perspective. So for us to do this, we'll take a huge amount of spending. Let me give you a few facts and figures to show you how much we need to spend. So if you look at the top left hand corner here, energy demand and intensity, right? What this is showing you is in the next 10 years alone, just in the next 10 years, we need to reduce the amount of coal usage in the world by 70%. We need to reduce the amount of oil usage around the world by about 76% right? This is an enormous reduction that we need to create. And the only way to have these reductions is to replace that energy by something else. And that's going to come from potentially natural gas, hydrogen, solar, wind farms, battery storage, all of these areas, uh, thermal, all of these areas are going to have to help us replace the energy that we need to cut, right? Secondly, 
What kind of money are we spending? Look at this chart, this circle that you can see in the middle of your page here. This is power sector spending. This is the amount of money that the world is spending every year on things like poles and wires. Think about the overhead power cable, your power line that takes electricity from the power station to the office, to your home, to the school, to the hospital. Where, how is power carried across electricity wires? And that those electricity wires, right, we need to invest in more of them. We need to invest in the grid network, as we call it. So we have to invest more in renewable companies, wind farms, solar farms, all of these things we have to invest in. And currently, the world is spending about $800 billion a year. It says 0.8 billion. That should say 0.8 trillion. Today, the world is spending $800 billion a year, right? in infrastructure, in terms of wires, renewables, new pipelines, new electricity grid networks. We have to spend two and a half trillion dollars a year in the next eight years per year. We need to increase our spending by three times to get the kind of greener world that we need. So we're not talking about small adjustments that governments can pay for. They cannot afford to do this all themselves. They will need our capital. The utility companies, the infrastructure companies will need our capital to make it happen. And to take our capital, they'll have to pay you well long term. Think about wind and solar, right? Wind and solar farms, we have to increase by nearly five and a half times just in the next 10 years. This is not a small change. This is, these are enormous changes that we need to take place. So we need to increase, for example, solar PV. PV stands for photovoltage. It's the way we look at solar energy. That capacity has to go from 600 gigawatts in the world today to 5,000 gigawatts. So again, these numbers seem so enormous, but what it's saying to you is we're not having a small percentage change in renewables. We need to have enormous change in renewable energies to make the world a greener place. Just in the next 10 years, we need the energy supply to be from 27% in renewables to 61%. Big, big changes. But it's not all about energy power. It's about buildings as well. Most of our buildings that we live in, our homes, our offices, our schools, our hospitals, they, they don't really have, uh, let's say, good insulation. They often are poor in terms of energy usage, poor in terms of energy a retention, and we need to improve that. Think about the lighting. Think about how many of us have moved to LED lighting away from halogen lighting or original kind of you know incandescent light bulbs. We are moving away from high energy to lower energy. Think about your washing machines, your vacuum cleaners, your uh, your hair dryers. All of these machines are using lower energy than they did five or ten years ago. And then you think about transport. Right. We need to move more people off combustion engine cars to electric vehicles, but not just electric vehicles. We need electric transport. We need more train systems. We need more uh, kind of underground systems which are based on electricity. If we do this right, we are going to effectively change how people travel and the emissions that they conduct. And it will mean you know, effectively people take less flights because if they know they have an electric vehicle that can take them from A to B, you know, in a much cheaper fashion because of electric vehicles, then that's going to reduce some of the cost on flying because people will fly less and have the comfort of their own cars. And again, these are enormous changes that were happening right now around the world. Electric vehicles in most countries in the world, especially within Europe, we expect within the next 10 years, that 60 to 70% of all cars should be electric vehicle, right? Sold each year. So we're seeing a dramatic change in people's behavior. So what kind of infrastructure companies, you know, I've already mentioned many of these, but what kind of infrastructure companies do we really like? What defines our kind of focus around infrastructure? And what does it mean to us? So I want to leave you with one thing, first of all. Whenever you think about, you know, Afin Hawang's Clearbridge global infrastructure strategy. The best thing to think about is to think about companies which are essential to you and me. The infrastructure companies that Afin Hawang's portfolio invests in are essential companies, companies that you and I need every single day to conduct our lives. The water companies, the electricity companies, the gas companies, the railways, the toll roads, the airports, the communication systems, all of these are critical to our lifeblood, right?
Without this, we can't exist. We can't have a normal conducting lives. Our economies can't function effectively. And so we look at these two areas as separate. First of all, the companies which are regulated or contracted. This is where a regulator, an independent body or a body of the government says to the utility company, the electric water or gas company, this is how much money you can earn. This is the rough you know, return that you can have over time. And you know, we want you to be regulated because you own strategic important assets that the world needs. And we cannot ask, we cannot allow you to charge whatever you like. We need you to have affordable rates for our populations. At the same time, the regulator is there to make sure the companies invest in the right way for the future. And that's also really important. So the beauty of these companies is they have assets. When you think about the assets of a utility company, if it's a water company, think about a dam, think about a reservoir, think about a lake, water systems, sewage systems. These are the assets that they own. And the beauty of these companies is these assets don't last for five or 10 years. They last for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And they can generate a return based on those assets for many, many years. So those stable cash flows lead to, as I said right at the beginning, stable dividends, which are linked to inflation, which are linked to bond rises. So as interest rates and inflation rise, they can effectively charge more. The other area that we invest in is user pay. Simply speaking, you use it, you pay for it. Think about the toll roads, the railway systems, the airports, the communication systems. If you have a smartphone, right, the only way that smartphone can operate, if you can, now you can do banking on your smartphones, you can listen to these webcasts on, the, on your smartphones, you can watch you know, media, you can play games, you can do a whole lot of things on your smartphones because they are mini computers, powerful mini computers. But for them to work, they need data. They need information. They need connectivity. And so communication networks, tower systems, the rollout of 4G and 5G is absolutely critical to the, effectively the continuity of our lives from a kind of technology perspective. All of these companies get paid by usage. The more you use them, the more they get paid. The more the economy grows, the more they get paid. And so these companies are often very attractive as well for opportunities in terms of growth. They may pay slightly le less dividends compared to utilities, but they're very attractive companies. So you might then say, well, okay, if we're looking at an infrastructure fund overall, and you're, you've got these ideas about how these companies can fit together, they can benefit from the world today, they can combat inflation, they can combat rising interest rates because they can compensate for that with rising prices. What are the benefits overall of infrastructure companies? And the answer to that is one, first of all, they're growing. Hopefully all the stuff I've even talked about in terms of decarbonization, net zero, the world becoming greener, that's a major growth driver. So is communications rollout right? 5G networks around the world. These are big drivers to long-term growth. The second point is these companies create strong, steady cash flows that deliver strong, steady dividends. The third point is inflation, that these companies can benefit to a certain extent or at least compensate for inflation as effectively their revenues are linked to inflation. When have you ever paid less for a toll road? When have you ever paid less to use the train system? Each and every year, sometimes multiple times in a year, you pay more for these services, right? Over time, the cost of these things rises. And the final point is diversification. If you put many of these good quality, high quality infrastructure companies from around the world together, so don't just pick them all in one country, pick them from all over the world because that's true diversification. There is nothing that links an Australian electric company to a UK water company to a renewable company in the US, to a gas business in Canada. None of these things are connected. These companies work because they have monopolies. They have strong ways of making money in their own markets. And putting all of these things together in one portfolio gives you nice, steady returns, but it also gives you low correlation, i.e. the connectivity to other portfolios. So what are some of the key themes that we're playing today? I've mentioned a few of these already, so hopefully none of these are now new because I've mentioned it two or three times. The first one, what are the key things that we want to invest in as a theme within our portfolio? 
One, decarbonisation. We want to invest in companies which have got cleaner energy, which are building renewables. And we want those companies that have the renewables, the wind farms, the solar farms, creating energy on long-term contracts and giving that to the marketplace. That to us is a very long-term attractive area, right? So we want those kind of companies which are also moving away the utility companies, which are saying, we want to close down our coal power stations, our oil power stations, and we want to transition to cleaner fuel, cleaner renewables. And we like those companies, those companies which are doing that, but are being under-recognized by the marketplace. You may assume that everybody, the investors, stock market researchers, people would know the companies which are changing. But because they sometimes look at those companies, those old utility companies with old eyes. They don't see the change. They, they're looking for the new shiny things. They're looking for the, the, you know, the interesting technology company. They're looking for the, the Facebooks and Netflix, the Amazons, this world. They're not looking at some of those traditional businesses, which may be moving at a much slower pace. But even in those companies, change is happening. And that's where you, make, you can make long-term returns. We're looking at global utilities that are making and cleaning up their, their effectively their balance sheet. You know, many of you are business owners on this call. You know, sometimes it's easier sometimes in a business to add assets over time, but sometimes the market doesn't recognize all the good things that you're doing in a business. Sometimes you need to separate parts of your business to realize value. And that's what some of the big utility companies are doing. They're saying, look, we're not being recognized for all the good things that we're doing, the good work that we have, the good assets that we have. We need to separate some of these assets. Maybe we take out the nuclear power of our business and we put it in a different company and realize the value of that. Maybe we take out the gas part of our business and put it into a different company and realize the value of that. Utility companies around the world are starting to effectively simplify. We look at recovery as a key theme. The pandemic has slowed the world down. People are traveling less, but they're starting to recover. They're starting to travel a bit more, both domestically, on the roads, on the train systems, and internationally using airports. The airports are going to be slower to recover because people are still slightly cautious, especially business travelers. If you can be at home doing a call or in the office, why do you need to travel? So some areas of the infrastructure world will recover much slower than others. But we're already seeing dramatic increases in the use of toll roads, in the use of railroad systems, in the use of seaports. And the last theme that we're really playing is the 5G evolution. The data that mobile phone companies, broadband companies need is increasing. Therefore, they have to invest in tower companies. These are the companies that have the micro receiver dishes that allow the mobile companies to operate. So what are the, you know, we've talked about the key challenges, right? The, the key challenges that the market is trying to deliver is things like rising rates and rising inflation. We've talked about that. Market volatility. And we've talked about that in the sense that, you know, volatility cre creates different prices, high prices and low prices. And that allows the professional investor who is patient, who can see the change to invest. We also see an, env an environment where we see growth. Infrastructure companies need capital. They are growing and they have to grow to develop this cleaner, greener world with more effectively technology embedded in it. And then we have income stability. The beauty of many of these infrastructure companies is they pay steady dividends, growing dividends over time. So if you look at our portfolio, you know, our, our strategy concept, you can see that these are the kind of uh, areas that we invest in. The two charts on the right-hand side, the pie chart, show you the geographical spread of the companies that are invested in the strategy. The strategy invests in about 36 companies around the world today. And if you look at where these companies are from, 45% come from USA and Canada. The USA is only about 25% of that. Right. Many global portfolios often have 50, 60 percent in the US. We don't. We see opportunities around the world in Western Europe, in Asia Pacific, in Latin America. We want to spread those companies all over the world. Secondly, in terms of sectors, we want to have exposure to multiple sectors, electric, gas, toll roads. We want to make sure we're diversified in lots of good infrastructure businesses.
And you can see from our top 10 positions here, we have companies all over the world. Iberdrola, a Spanish utility company, which is also the world's largest wind farm operator. Atlas Arteria, which is an Australian toll road company, but most of its toll roads are based in Europe and in the US. We have National Grid, which is an electricity grid network. How does, um, and gas network, how does electricity and gas get from A to B? We don't care who produces it. We don't even care who sells it, but we love the companies that own the strategic asset of how it gets from A to B. And National Grid owns a lot of grid network in the UK and US. We look at a company like Exelon, which is in the US, which is a, uh, a utility company, which has recently separated its nuclear part of the business from its traditional utility part of the business. And guess what? The overall value of the company has increased. We see these wonderful opportunities around the world to build a portfolio. Um, just to highlight a couple of points um, in terms of income strength, you might say, well, how strong is this income? How dependable is it that comes from your strategy? And what this chart is showing on page 16 is the green bar shows you the level of dividends you know, uh, each month over the last three years. And you can see, and this is the dividends on an annualized basis. And you can see that the dividends have generally been between four and a half and 6% throughout that whole period of time. The average three-year uh, yield is about 5.58%. So a very attractive yield and beating inflation long-term. And the last slide I really want to show you is this, right? Risk and return. You might say, AJ, you know, infrastructure sounds like a really good idea, but I already have global property. Isn't property the same as, you know, real estate investment trusts? Isn't that the same as infrastructure? Don't I get the same profile? And the answer is no. REITs, there's nothing wrong with it. You get some good returns long term. You can get some very attractive types of real estate investment trusts, investing in commercial, effectively residential properties, all very attractive. But there is a lot more volatility in those companies. If you look at the left-hand chart, what this shows you is the 10-year risk versus return. And the green dot is saying that over 10 years, infrastructure companies using an index, you know, not our strategy, just using a broad index, shows that they've made about 10% returns annualized over 10 years with about 11.5% volatility. The purple dot says REITs have made about 9% return, but for nearly 14.5% volatility. Effectively, a lot more volatility for a little bit less return, right? So these are completely different. Real estate is more about rental, shorter term contracts compared to infrastructure, which is much longer term and much more essential. So I just wanted to kind of leave you with these kind of key points here and recognize that one of the, the last benefits I want to leave you with is stability. Stability is no, not all about upside, right? Stability is about when the markets are going down, how do you perform? How much strength do you have in your portfolio? And one of the beauty of infrastructure companies is because they're essential, when markets are falling, they often fall less. This year, when the stock markets were falling about 5% in the first three months of the year, this strategy was up over 5%. It can often buck the trend. And that's because people recognize the essential services that these companies provide. If you look long-term over 10 years, when stock markets, and this is the right-hand chart, when stock markets have risen, that's the orange bar, you know, infrastructure has gone up by about 70%. But when stock markets have gone down, infrastructure has only gone down by about 50%. So stability, building long-term returns is also about making sure you don't lose money in the short term as well. So I'll stop there and take questions from, from you yourself. Thank you, AJ, for your insightful sharing. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really excited to start the Q&A session. I see quite a number of interesting questions in our Q&A box. Let us begin with the first question. Now, with most major economies facing all-time high inflation, what is the view on central bank's approach to curb inflation? So great question. And I think I already answered part of that in my uh, presentation today. I hopefully I got answered a lot of these questions in my presentation, but central banks around the world are increasing their interest rates, but they're doing so cautiously. As I mentioned, they have to, to try to reduce inflation because inflation is too high in many parts of the world, but they have to balance that equation by not trying to kill off economic demand and the consumer. So around the world, we will see interest, rising interest rates. Even the European Union will slowly increase interest rates by the end of this year, early 2023. 
but it's a balancing act and different central banks in the world are at different speeds. The US and the UK are probably a bit faster right now, but they need to be. Right. Thank you, AJ. Now, sticking with the, the issue on uh, rising interest rate, how do you see this impacting companies' ability to pay uh, dividends? Great question. So again, I think generally speaking, when effectively, if you've got rising interest rates, it means your debt cost of your company has gone up. If your debt cost is going up, your profits must be going down if you cannot increase your prices. So the companies which do not have the ability to increase their prices because they don't have that competitive power, they're the ones you should be concerned about. And companies like that, if they have got good dividends, they're probably going to have to take a cut or be steady for a while. What you need to look for is companies that have real pricing power. Right, the ability for them to be able to increase prices to compensate for rising interest rates and rising inflation, and that's the important thing. Find those kind of businesses or those managers who are investing in those kind of areas, and that's why I highlight infrastructure as being a solution to that area. Right. Thank you. Now moving on to our next question: Which re regional markets look small, favorable, or rather still look favorable? Uh, in this high inflation and rising rate environment? I, I think, look, in terms of regional economies, I think you've got some smaller economies in Europe which have got some very good, good businesses. But because of the economic shocks and the slowdown in parts of Europe, people are afraid to invest in these kind of companies. We've seen European stock markets come down, but we've also seen significant falls in kind of Asian stock markets. And I think there is opportunities in countries in Asia where we start to see, because things, countries like Malaysia, Vietnam, you know, these countries have a high link to exports. And, as, and, and some of these exports haven't happened because of the pandemic and because of restrictions. As the world starts to open up again, we, we're going to start to see some of this returning. And I would not be surprised to see some you know, significant improvements in some of these stock markets, but on an individual stock basis. It's hard to say that the whole market will rise because there may be some traditional companies which weigh that stock market down. Again, selectivity is key. I don't think there's any easy answers out there. All right, thank you. I believe this is actually... Uh Kind of like a popular question now. Now, uh, what is the outlook for global oil? Do you see, you know, uh, com commodity or energy prices uh, still have room to move up? We, well, Bobby, uh, we see pr energy prices being uh, high for quite a while. Do we see them rising for now? It partly depends on the uh, the Ukraine Russia crisis. If that war gets worse and countries around the world continue their sanctions, you know, Europe at the moment has not sanctioned oil. You know, European markets are still taking oil from certain parts of Russia. They're still taking gas from certain parts of Russia. If they stop certain aspects of that to effectively put more pressure on Russia, that could potentially lead to rising energy prices further. We're already seeing that. Do we see it at the price really blowing up? Not really. Uh, we're starting to see additional supply coming on from different markets. But Russia is one of the biggest producers in the world of oil and gas. So it's not a small country in its supply. So energy and commodity prices are rising. Countries like Russia and Ukraine are the bread baskets of Europe. They produce a lot of potassium, potash, uh, nickel. So in terms of minerals and commodities, we will see, I think, elevated prices. You know, we're not forecasting much higher prices, but we're going to see elevated high prices for quite some time because some of these areas, there are no replacements from other parts of the world. Supply takes time to come on stream. So I think elevated prices, we should get used to that for a while until we see some change in the Russia-Ukraine situation. Right, okay. Now, next question is, uh, besides uh, inflation fears, uh, markets are already anticipating, you know, a stagflation of the possible recession. What is your thought on this? Yeah, I think stagflation in different parts of the world is absolutely, uh, I think, absolutely going to happen. I think what you're going to see is inflation rising and stagflation, just to be very clear, is inflation rising and effectively economic growth either slowing or going negative, right? It doesn't have to go straight to negative. It can just go from being 5% to 4% to 3%. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that already. You could argue that in different parts of Europe, we're already in stagflation. Economic growth is slowing, right? We're coming down from 4 and 5% growth. And we're seeing that. The IMF yesterday said that, you know, 
3% is what we're roughly expecting from the big economic nations, the G7 countries next year, we're going to start to see slowing growth and rising inflation. So I think stagflation in different parts of the market is expected. But the question is, is how bad, right? You can effectively go from 3% to 2% economic growth for some countries. Yes, have rising inflation. But actually, what you need to look at is unemployment. If unemployment starts to go up, that would be more problematic. But if you look at the US, for example, unemployment is almost at an all-time low. It's at about 3.5%. So even though you could argue that some parts of the US are in a stagflation environment, the unemployment rate is so low and people are getting wage growth that they're compensating right now. And you're seeing that across Europe as well. Wage rise is happening, maybe at a slower rate, compensating. But yes, stagflation is not something that should be a surprise. Slowing economies, rising inflation, but we expect that inflation to normalize within the next 12 months or so. Start to go from the high numbers in the UK, for example, maybe go from 7% more closer to 3 to 4% within the next 12 months. We expect that to be similar in other parts of the world, but it takes time to do that. And in the meantime, it's painful on the consumer. All right. Okay. Now, um, moving on to your sharing on infrastructure investment. Now, from your sharing, uh, infrastructure is a good hedge against inflation. But what about recession during the time of recession? Does infrastructure still have potential to perform? Absolutely. And that's, that's, you know, that's a key part. And something I hopefully mentioned during the call as well is like infrastructure is a, a substantial long-term theme. It is not a theme for the next one, two, three years. It's going to need our capital for the next 10, 20, 30 years. And so economic recessions can happen, markets can come down, but countries are committed to spending enormous amounts of money. The US is looking to spend over a trillion dollars in broadband, better water networks, better electricity networks, better train networks. European Union is looking to spend 750 billion euros, about $850 billion just in the next five years on improving infrastructure. So many governments around the world are spending the money to improve the amount of electric renewables in terms of wind farms, solar, transport systems, but they need more. They need to do more. And these utility companies need to grow faster, right? And, and they are. And so that capital that they need is going to come from people like us as well, the private investors. And that's why it's going to be a long-term growth opportunity, a steady eddy, the portfolio that, that you have in your client portfolio that just ticks along. You've got the spicy things. You've got the technology funds and the more interesting EM funds and all of those things which are more shiny and they're going to give you much higher returns. But where is your portfolio that's going to deliver you about a 5% income over time each year, roughly about a 5% income, and also give you a, a return of, let's say, 5 to 5.5% above inflation over long periods of time? That's the kind of portfolio we've, we've kind of created with Afin Hawang, right? We've built this portfolio to deliver about a 5.5% return above inflation over long cycles. If you measure us over five years, that's what we want to deliver per year, annualized over that compounding period. All right, thank you. Now, okay. Um, now, when we talk about infrastructure investment, how does uh, how did uh, infrastructure investment portfolio fare in the past quarter? You know, past quarter was actually a volatile uh, quarter. So, uh, how did investment uh, infrastructure investment actually fare, and how did it actually manage to hold up against the volatility? Yeah, so the quick answer is, you know, we were up over six percent, and the market was down over five percent. So we were up market was down. And the reason for that is our infrastructure companies, our pipeline companies, our, some of our electric companies, our renewable companies, they all added value because the market recognized these are the areas that we need to spend more money on. These are the companies that will have to grow in the future to compensate, to get the world away from using gas and oil from Russia. So remember, the world has gone from energy stability, right? Energy integration, and they have now look at effectively energy security. The world has to think about how do we become more independent as countries, have our own energy supplies and not rely on other parts of the world that can hold us to that ransom. That's what's happening. And that's why some of these companies you know, benefited from that. As investors said, these companies are gonna have even better growth in the future. So next question is, um, now what is your view on decentralization of mega infrastructure? Decentralization of infrastructure. Yeah, mega infrastructure. So, yeah, so 
I, I look, I think if, if I take that right as a kind of perspective, decentralizing, look, we are seeing big utility companies around the world break their portfolios up. They're saying, we don't want to be good at everything. And investors don't recognize if we're good at lots of things. They don't give us the, the right value. So they're separating. I gave you an example of a company called Exelon. Exelon is one of the biggest utility companies in America, right? And they have gas and electricity supply to the public. And what they did was, but they also created energy using nuclear power. And what they recognized was the investors didn't understand the value of that nuclear business, part of the business. It was very profitable, very attractive. But by separating that and investing it into a different company, the value of the two companies was more than the value of the one company. And that happened in February, and we benefited from that, hence why we also did well in that first quarter. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, looks like we only have time for one final question. Um, now, uh, AJ, can you tell us what is the, what are the role of the government and climate change or ESG in infrastructure investment and how investors could actually benefit from it? So again, super question. Governments around the world are trying to decarbonize their societies. They are, they've put in an agenda. So we have things like, you know, fit for 55, fit for 55. Sounds a strange. That's the policy that the European Union has to say, how do we reduce emissions, carbon dioxide emissions, by 55% by 2030? So in the next eight years, how do we reduce emissions by nearly 50%? And they have a policy on how they're going to do that. They're going to effectively build more infrastructure companies, build more re renewables, build more transport, take people away from using their cars, and build better quality long-term uh, high-speed rail network transports that will allow people to travel cheaper. So give you a simple example. If you take the ferry from France to the UK, that ferry obviously consumes carbon dioxide, fuel, oil, gas. But if you use the Eurotunnel that links effectively Paris to London, that has one-eighth of the level of emissions that the ferry does. So immediately, if you can increase rail transport, network transport, electrify your network, take the diesel uh, trains off the system and add electric trains to the system, all of a sudden you reduce your emissions, right? And if you can create the energy from renewables, you could reduce your emissions. And so ESG policy by governments is absolutely critical to giving you infrastructure companies direction. And once they've given direction, the regulators will stand next to the infrastructure companies to say, how can we help you develop the right policy to grow your business. Again, not for the next two or three years, but for the next few decades. And again, they need our money to do that. Okay, thank you, Vijay. Now, before you end your presentation, can you probably, you know, sum up in a few key takeaways why investment, uh, infrastructure investment is important for investors to add into their portfolio? What are the key attractions? Yep. Simply speaking, you there are two real issues in the world that we face today, right? And that's rising prices, either from food, fuel, feed, you know, from all of these different factors. And when I talk about feed, agricultural feed, if we have to feed our animals more expensive um, uh, kind of growth food, then that's going to lead to rising food prices as well. If you need to put more expensive um uh, fertilizer on the ground to create your wheat, your rice, you know, your vegetables, that's going to lead to rising food prices. All of these things are impacting us. So food and fuel are effectively the co rising cost is inflation. And that inflation impact has to be compensated for. So that's why on this page, you can see there are two major challenges. How do you get a, a steady income in a low rate environment? And yes, interest rates might be rising, but they're not rising that quickly yet. And how do you benefit when inflation is rising over time? And the answer to that is you invest in a portfolio or strategy that can deliver you a nice attractive yield of about 5% because you're buying companies whose dividends are growing. They, these companies, their dividends are not static. If you buy the right types of companies, you're buying the dividends which are growing and they're rising above inflation. And you get those types of companies from regulated utility companies and good user pay infrastructure companies, your toll roads, your airports, your seaports. And the second point is, where do you get growth from? 
How do you get growth in a rising inflationary market? Because that's important. And that's why we target our return to be inflation plus five and a half percent over time. Because by doing that, we can compensate for the inflation impact in the world. So, you know, these are the two challenges, inflation, rising interest rates, and our portfolio has an ability to kind of develop and compensate that for that over time and deliver healthy income and growth over time. Steady Eddie. All right. Once again, thank you, AJ, for your great sharing. It was a pleasure having you with us today. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our webinar. We hope today's session gives you better insights and ideas on how to position your investment portfolio to benefit from the current market environment. I'm sorry we're not able to cover all questions. Please feel free to reach out to your relationship manager to learn the key investment teams for your investment needs. You could also gain market insights offered through our HSBC Wealth Insights platform. We look forward to seeing you again in our coming webinar. Until then, do stay safe and take care. Thank you for joining us and have a pleasant evening. Bye, everyone.